Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden. He drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The year is 2754. Starfarer is a starship presently en route to the distant Proxima Centauri. The vessel's journey takes centuries. We've never seen Earth, and we might never see our destination either. Launched by a neo-Christian conglomerate, Starfarer is a colony ship, originally housing 50,000 inhabitants. It's a world. But war never changes, and humanity carried war to the stars. The mutiny, that's what the conflict was called, devastated much of the ship and destroyed the old social order. Three rival states have emerged within Starfarer each with a different vision of the future. The militaristic protectors, the supposedly egalitarian brotherhood, and the church of the elect. One of these entities will decide the fate of the shipborn, and maybe they'll decide much more than that. Long-range probes sent to Proxima Centauri detected the presence of a sentient alien civilization with a medieval level of technology. Turns out our destination is already inhabited. Welcome to episode 46, in which we'll explore Colony Ship, a post-Earth role-playing game by Iron Tower Studios. Christianity Among the Stars, Noah's Ark with Combat Cyborgs. This video will not be spoiling the ultimate mysteries of the ship. We'll do some side quests, a bit of the main quest, but the vast majority of the content will not be spoiled. I promise I'll be responsible. Have you heard the story of Vince D. Weller? It's an old tale. The mid-2000s were the first years of RPG death, a traumatic decade when the game development companies were no longer interested in creating the types of experiences we grew up playing during the Silver Age of RPG. That's your Fallouts and Baldur's Gates. Instead, the industry was dominated by teen RPGs that were perceived as mechanically unsophisticated and thematically not serious. Different individuals adopted different coping strategies. Personally, I spent years playing EVE Online, learning Econ 101 concepts and racial slurs. Some people got into game dev. Vince D. Weller decided that if you want to play a good RPG, you'll have to make one yourself. He gathered a small but an impressively international team, and in March 2004, the Iron Tower Studios started work on the Age of Decadence, a post apocalyptic role-playing game with an ancient alien story and a Roman Empire aesthetic. The game was released in 2015, and in 2016, Iron Tower announced Dungeon Rats, a party-based tactical RPG spin-off. A short adventure, it took about a year to make. And after that was out, they began work on Colony Ship, the RPG will be playing today. The studio has three titles in its ludography now, and three is the smallest number of elements required to create a pattern, allowing us to identify the conventions of the Iron Tower artistic language. What do all these games have in common? Well, uh, very high combat difficulty is one thing. If you want an impressive body count, play a combat specialist. Secondly, Vince has a very recognizable writing voice. The games are somehow both bookish and succinct, with plenty of memorable characters and many quotable lines. I heard the writing described as grimdark, and I suppose it's true. Every character in the Age of Decadence is a manipulative sociopath protected by layers of contingency plans. Is this realistic? Probably not. The iodine-deficient individuals inhabiting a post-apocalyptic world would probably not be as articulate and sophisticated as the game portrays them. But it's like Sorkin said, the properties of people and the properties of characters have almost nothing to do with each other. The rules of drama are very much separate from the properties of life. A world full of sociopathic manipulators is an excellent platform for an entertaining story. 
the difficulty selection screen. The underdog mode is the default difficulty, it's how you're supposed to play, but it's color-coded in red for a reason. The hero difficulty is described here as a story mode, however this is not true. It's essentially a standard RPG difficulty, no easier than any of the classics. If you are not a genre expert, there is no shame in picking this option. For the purposes of this video, I'm selecting the underdog mode. The game uses an Old Testament naming scheme for characters. Our name is Malachi, and we're handsome-ish. Every decision we make on this screen is important, and the first thing you need to be aware of is that Colony Ship is a party-based game. It's possible to play solo, but you'll require extensive meta knowledge to pull it off. Do not try it unless you know what you're doing. The number of followers we can have depends on our charisma score. The maximum possible party size is 4. You can get there with a charisma of 6 if you are willing to take a feat after leveling up. Investing full 10 points in a stat unlocks a special extraordinary ability. These are only available at character creation. The Dodge This feat requires 10 points in perception and makes you an expert marksman. Intelligence of 10 unlocks Mastermind, which provides, among other things, a bonus to learning rate. Skills in this game are improved with use, like in the Elder Scrolls. 10 points in Constitution unlocks Healing Factor, which enables hit point and stat regeneration in combat. This is what I'm picking for Malachi, purely because of how exotic it is. Interest in con builds seem to be uncommon in RPGs. Welcome to Cargo Hold 3, aka The Pit, aka The Free City, although I've never met anyone who actually called it that. So the game looks really good. Compare it to the previous Iron Tower products. The Age of Decadence and Dungeon Rats were made using something called Torque 3D. I guess it makes sense thematically that games about ancient technology were made using ancient technology. For Colony Ship, the devs switched to Unreal Engine, and the results speak for themselves. Anyway, it's time for us to show the world, show the ship, what the free citizenry of Cargo Hold 3 are capable of. First thing we should do is put together a crew. Jonas sent some gun thugs to harass Abe, says Evans, a gun for hire and our future companion. Abe here went to the regulators, but Braxton said he can't spare any men. Jonas is the town's founder, mayor, a former scavenger, and the current owner of the most comfortable gamer chair on Starfarer. Some years ago, the pit became a target of imperialist aggression from the Brotherhood, the remnants of the mutineers and a major ship power. Braxton and the regulators were hired to deal with them, which they succeeded in doing. This is how they became the town's cops. What do we do now? We have to see it through, I suppose. It's not my fight, says Braxton. I have nothing against Jonas, but this time he's gone too far. We can side with either of them, but it's too early for us to be making political decisions. When a new companion joins the party, you should open their character sheet and tag the skills you want them to specialize in. I make Evans a rifleman and a biotech expert, which is this game's version of the medical skill. That's probably not optimal, but it worked for me. We should do a bunch of side quests and get more experienced. Ward Salvage used to be a prospecting outfit. One day, they found something truly valuable, once-in-a-lifetime find. They tried selling it, and it got them killed. Faith Ward is the last living member of the outfit, and she wants retribution. We found a key on a body of a dead diver, deep down in mission control ruins. I've never seen a lock that goes with a key like that. It stands to reason that whatever is behind the door fitting the key is worth a fortune. Could be it opens up Admin Center itself, who knows? Admin Center? You've heard stories, I'm sure. It goes back to the last battle of the mutiny. Legend has it, when the ship authority so all was lost. The last few defenders sealed themselves inside admin center to deny it to the enemy. Sealed it permanently. Interesting. Perhaps one day we'll solve this mystery. But first things first. We distract the bad guy while Faith sneaks up behind him and takes him out. Since they're down a man, the battle will be much easier, but far from effortless. 
combat in Iron Tower games tends to cause a strong polarizing reaction in people. You either love it or hate it. If you look at the footage of the Age of Decadence, you can see that it superficially resembles a strategy game. There are turns, action points, a square grid. This is all fake shit. The truth is, there is almost no meaningful decision making. You execute the same plan over and over until the dice rolls in your favor. That's how it actually works. Well, worked. The good news is that the combat was much improved in the Age of Decadence 2, aka Colony Ship. For one, cover is a thing now. Positioning and flanking are important, as is managing items that grant cooldown-based abilities. Consumables now play a big role, and you'll be using them in almost every fight. These are usually different types of thrown objects. Smoke grenades, poison gas, flashbangs. I've never killed anyone before, says Faith. Our dialogue choices determine which special companion feat she gets. Lazarus was a mad dog who had to be put down. Is this the only way? Kill or be killed? Ask your father. This choice gives her the assassin trait, which I suspect is less optimal of the two options, but I don't care. Faith is gonna be our computer hacker and electronics expert. The game uses a Tetris-style inventory, similar to Arcanum or Stalker. Not all adversaries are human. Here is a battle against an autocannon turret. The turret AI is predictable. It shoots whoever is the closest and targets the torso. Survive the opening burst and you'll be fine. Courthouse, the combat arena, the genius of Jonah's style of governance, or non-governance, monetizable legal system with bookies, spectators, and special effects. We are running low on legal representation, says Chief Justice. Lost three officers last week in a string of challenging cases. First defendant is one John Doe, meaning he refused to tell us his name. We call that an aggravating circumstance. Our friend Mr. Doe stands accused of cheating during a game of combat. He denies the charge. Don't they all, though? A jury of his peers, in this case fellow poker players, agree that John Doe cheated and also had shifty eyes, so the case goes to trial. John's been on a diet of water and Antab half rations for three weeks, so I'm guessing he'll present a pretty weak case. Guilty as charged, eh? Before we commit to truly challenging fights, we should finish assembling a party. Jeb, the last follower we'll get in the pit, lives in a miserable cargo container on the edge of town. He's in debt to a local small business owner. If I go back empty-handed, as soon as you fall asleep, four hard boys gonna come around and close the account for good. Let him come. You really want this to be your last stand? An empty metal box at the edge of nowhere? As far as lost stands go, it's as good as any. Jeb doesn't have any money, but he knows where to get money. Our new friend is more experienced than the rest of the party, almost a two-level difference, and wields a shotgun. He could be respect into a submachine gunner if you so desire. If the skill checks and battles in the pit get too hard, we can go explore different sections of the ship to get experience. Traveling is done via Skyrail. There are no trains anymore, so we'll have to walk. Well, our characters do. Mechanically, traveling is menu-based and instant. The purpose of the hydroponic division was to adapt Terran plants to the alien environment of Proxima Centauri. The place was abandoned during the mutiny and subsequently reclaimed by its own creations. Accelerated adaptation. New traits develop almost instantly. Can you imagine our oaks and maples growing on Proxima one day? I wonder how the locals would feel about that. It's not like we can turn the ship around and go back now. So like it or not, they'll have to share. The mutant frog enemies have low HP, but they're usually encountered in swarms. There are three varieties. The melee frogs attack your legs, so make sure you wear something with melee protection. Ranged frogs poison and blind you, and later we'll meet extra annoying psionic frogs. Unclaimed technology is to be found deeper in the jungle. A power saw, an industrial tool repurposed as a melee weapon. Unfortunately, it runs on energy cells, and these are always in short supply. 
why. Pre-mutiny era training tokens are another precious find. You put them into learning machines such as this one to upload a bunch of skills into your brain. Hopefully now we are experienced enough to tackle some of the more challenging content here in the pit. The Dalton brothers, showing a poverty of imagination matching their actual poverty, they decided to strike out and plunder the riches of the mission control ruins. By all accounts, they were lucky to survive, but unlucky to return empty-handed. This is after running up a substantial debt to finance their venture, said debt causing our business community undue hardship and financial burden. The way combat sequences are designed in this game, multiple characters will be taking damage, so having a dedicated tank is useful but unreliable. Open and shut case. Next on the docket is Ebenezer Harding, also known as Hard Ben. This one has been testing this town patience ever since he moved here, having killed three men in cold blood in the mission control ruins, and then he returned here to sell their cargo, the nerve. Turns out the alleged victims worked for Mr. Jonas Redford himself, which makes Mr. Redford the rightful owner of the aforementioned cargo. Though unscrupulous and ill-mannered, Mr. Harding isn't entirely ignorant of the boons of civilization, he has several gizmos in his possession, including an energy shield. As I'm sure you're aware, I'm obliged by law to disclose all facts of the case that might come up during the trial. Gadgets are high-tech equipment, usually defensive in nature, that occupy a dedicated slot. Equipping and upgrading a gadget appropriate for your skill set is essential for combat success. A cool new feature. But the most significant change from the Age of Decadence is the new stealth system that is no longer based on dialogue window choices. The amount of noise generated during a stealth mission depends on our clothing, skills, special perks, and actions performed during the stealth segment. Just like everything else in this game, stealth rewards specialization. Experts can clear entire maps of enemies while remaining undetected. This guy, Tanner, our acquaintance, or perhaps even a friend, has obtained something very precious, an access card to the section of the ship's armory still unclaimed by scavengers. Is it real? Is it real? Son, if you don't have the stones for it, just say so. Don't insult me. Before the mutineers took it over, the armory contained an impressive arsenal intended for the future colony. Stay alert, says Evans. Too many people have disappeared here lately. Hey, it's our friends, the mutant frogs. Some years ago, when I lived in Belarus, I used to buy an illegal fitness compound made by a company called Frog Tech. It made you look very frog-like and bloated. There were no other observable effects. Solidarity with mutant kin. Welcome back. Technical Officer Ulysses S. Colton. It has been 117 years since your last visit. Interesting, so this is how long ago the mutiny was. M-Class Converter, model FC4, says the terminal. It's colony tech. What do you think it's worth? The monks would know. The cyborgs from ECLSS. They were human once, but they're about as human as a toaster now. The device is not our only bounty. This is a suit of energy armor. It provides the wearer with a bubble shield, an HP buffer. And this is a powerful energy rifle. A phenomenal weapon that unfortunately consumes very expensive ammunition which makes it impractical to use. A converter? Tanner is visibly disappointed. We can't sell the mystery machine, at least not in the pit. We might be able to find a buyer in the Habitat, which is the game's biggest city. To get to the Habitat, we need to go through the factory, a maze of corridors controlled by gangs. We are not ready to make the journey yet. This is Mission Control, formerly the domain of the Ship Authority. These days it's a vertically designed RPG dungeon. The upper level hosts a restaurant and a hotel. And the lowest level, well, we don't know because nobody has ever been there. Even the assembly members couldn't get below level 5. The assembly? Yes, the General Assembly. It's like a senate on old earth. I think it was quite a bit more complicated than that. The assembly was a front, the real show was backstage, not that it matters now. Hard to believe this was the most feared place on the ship once. 
Not all pre-mutiny technology was energy-based. They used conventional firearms as well. This ancient Lancer assault rifle was repaired with a pipe barrel. It's a technological chimera. Some of the areas of mission control are contaminated by strange fungus. The infection is a home to a new kind of creature. You ever fought these mind-sniffing worms before? It's easier than you think. Smash apart their hard shells and inside they're like pudding gooey and defenseless. That's it. That's all it takes. That's exactly what you said to Joey. Now the boy's a fucking vegetable. Yeah, yeah, Joey wasn't ever a big thinker, wasn't he? In fact, I can hardly tell the difference. Hargrave and his scavenger friends are trying to penetrate the force field without success so far. We can help them, but unlike Joey, Hargrave is something of a thinker, and once we complete all his errands, he will backstab us. So we attack first for an initiative bonus, one of the harder battles in mission control. I had to use a lot of consumables. Behind the force field was the journal of one of the original defenders of this place who died during the mutiny. He blames the leadership. How did it all come to pass? I wish I could tell you that we didn't see it coming, but I'd be lying. Can you believe this? Says Evans. This fella really thought he was on the right side of things. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. Hard to tell now. Yeah, now that we've been freed, it's really hard to tell if being a slave was as bad as they say. We recover the soldier's weapon, an ancient energy submachine gun. And on the level below, there is a broken robot we can fix, if we have all the required parts. It's an excuse to zoom in and admire just how good the graphics are in this game. A lot of effort was put into the visuals. This is easily as good as Wasteland 3. The path to the levels below is blocked by a retinal scanner. If the Honorable Walter Hastings himself couldn't pass through the door, the man lifts a small jar containing a human eye suspended in some kind of liquid. Who is Hastings? The last chairman of the assembly. If they didn't trust this guy, whom did they trust? They? The Synod, the Founding Fathers, whoever the fuck was running the show. They call him Shadow, says Faith. He is friendly enough, unless you have what he wants. Perhaps we'll meet Shadow again. The game wants us to go to the habitat, but before we venture forth, I want to showcase the funniest mission in the first chapter. It's a very basic fetch quest, available pretty much as soon as you start the game, but I intentionally delayed doing it until now. The Doctor Lady sends us to recover an implant, which we can do with no challenge whatsoever, and the purpose of this is to teach you how implants work. In these games, the protagonist often finds themselves manipulated and victimized by individuals more powerful than them. It's one of the tropes. It's fun to subvert it for a change by seizing initiative, talking shit, making demands and starting a firefight. No less than three discrete parties are unloading automatic weapons at each other inside a tiny cargo container basically for no reason. I love this. The last thing we should do before leaving is solve the conflict between Jonas, the mayor of the pit, and the regulators, the merc cops he hired to protect the community that now want to grab power for themselves. Another feature of these games is that faction leaders rarely have a coherent ethical philosophy, and most of them are basically just cynical power maxers. The political heuristics you learned in real life are not very useful here. In order to make an informed decision, we need to understand the community, and this can only be done by experiencing it, by talking to people, making friendships, living a life. The regulators are in the wrong. They provoke the conflict. But there is an advantage of siding with them. Braxton has friends in high places, specifically the Protector's faction in the Habitat, the heirs of the Ship Authority, the organization that was destroyed during the mutiny. Jonas, on the other hand, has an anarchist spirit, responsible for the town's unique character. But he is not skilled at governance. There is a third option of installing this lady. They call her Mercy. But I don't believe we get an opportunity to learn what she believes in. And if you fail the speech check, she has to be killed. Mercy's Fort is a fun sneak section if you have the skills. The final showdown. We sided with Jonas and are tasked with taking out the regulators, almost said ordinators. It's a multi-stage battle and we're given extra controllable companions. The smaller your party, the more help you get. The second stage is very hard and I had to use several precious consumables, including a stasis grenade which is basically priceless. 
good fucking riddance. Jonas doesn't have connections in the habitat, but he knows Mo Jackson, who commands a group of free-thinking citizens in the shuttle bay. Perhaps he can be our ally. We recover a lot of implants off the regulator's bodies. The amount you can install depends on your constitution score. With Con 10 we can get 7, and the implants can then receive further upgrades. Finishing the courthouse fights gets us noticed by someone powerful. I wonder if Neanderthals were as shocked by your outlandish appearance, the woman says. You're mutants. We're all mutants. You are mutants of the past, we are mutants of the future. Your species evolved to populate Earth and subdue it. Mine will subdue Proxima. The mutants are a matriarchal society that live in the radioactive heart of the ship. One of them, a man that calls himself Knurl, escaped. The Harbinger wants us to find and kill him. We eventually find the fugitive in mission control. Why does she want you dead? Because I don't want to live by their rules. The Harbinger and Knurl are two powerful, mutually exclusive late-game companions. There is no direct rail access to the habitat, not anymore. In order to get to their destination, merchants and travelers must go through the factory, a web of catwalks, home to the Detroit City Gang and their rivals, the Black Hand. The mercenary outfit, Thy Brother's Keepers, provides security on the toll road. A woman named Smiles will guide us from checkpoint to checkpoint until we reach the habitat. The name uh, does not reflect her personality. The service is not free. Jonas will be billed for this. The soundtrack communicates tension and the sense of danger. We walk right into an ambush. The final checkpoint was overtaken by the Black Hand. Smiles commands us to flee, but I think we'll stay and fight. To call this battle challenging would be an understatement. I had to replay it five or six times. Hell of a fight, grins the woman. Thanks for sticking around. Still alive, Evans whispers in disbelief. I thought we were gunners for sure. Maybe next time. The factory has a bunch of side areas to explore. Maybe it's the frogs that are the mutants of the future. They guard this thing, the fiery sword of Eden, a laser cutter with a bunch of biblical references carved into the handle. That's six banger Jack, says Jeb. There is a price on his head, so he's a bit jumpy. Price on his head? After negotiating with the Detroit City Gang, we lead a Keeper Strike Team versus the Black Hand Base. It's another multi-stage fight. Some of the Keepers are AI-controlled and basically impossible to keep alive, but our friend Smiles joins us as a temporary companion. Too bad she won't stick around forever. We did it, laughed Stanton, the leader of the Keepers. If I knew it would be that fucking easy, I'd have done it sooner. His speech is interrupted by a wounded messenger. When we attacked the Black Hand base, the Detroit City boys went behind our backs and took the entrance to the factory. They now control the toll road. This wouldn't have been the case if we were a better negotiator, but the problems of Stanton are not our problems. You have a visitor, says one of the Keepers, from the Habitat. You must be Thomas. Stanton. Call me Garrett. We've had an arrangement with Dumont. Since you've taken over his operations, our arrangement is now with you. What arrangement? From now on, you are working for the Brotherhood. You are free to run your operations as you see fit. But when we call, you come running. Is that understood? The Brotherhood is one of the three powerful nations of the ship. It just so happens that the other entrance to the factory is located right next to the Brotherhood-controlled area of the habitat. Stanton has no choice but to comply. That's just geopolitics. <laughs> The habitat consists of four megastructures. Three are still operational. The structure's rooftops support a huge amusement park where the people of the ship could enjoy some of the planetary pleasures. Grass, sand, trees. I liked the Proxima sets when I was here a few years back. Joyful, bug-eyed locals welcome the Terran colonists to their planet. The habitat is a huge area in terms of space, but when it comes to content, there is about as much to do here as in the pit, which is quite a bit, but not enough to make you feel overwhelmed.
Brotherhood. The Brotherhood are the descendants of the mutineers, and this structure is their home. Previously, we were only exposed to the lifestyle and the points of view of the Free City scavengers, which made me believe that life on the ship resembles something out of the Shadowrun franchise. This place is a culture shock. The woman is playing Raid Shadow Legends on her iPhone, a digital memorial to the heroes of the mutiny. You touch a name and it tells you their story. This little bar in the corner is not an important place in the grand scheme of things, and yet look how impressively detailed it is. What's on the menu? Depends on your rank. I thought only the protectors had ranks. The barkeep makes it clear we are on thin ice. I was talking about your social rank, friend. A measurement of your contribution to society. And who decides on a person's social status? The government decides, of course. But they represent the people. Is it better to live in a pod or in a cargo container? Opinions differ. Some individuals are lucky enough to have apartments. I am Storm, a storm that will wash away this farce they call the Brotherhood like shit off a bulkhead. These guys are the rebels. I'm not sure what they believe in, couldn't pass the dialogue checks. If I had to guess, they probably disagree with more authoritarian elements of the local culture. But the Brotherhood has an excuse. The rival nations are quite literally a block away. No freedom to the enemies of freedom, and the enemies of freedom are many. All right, let's go check on their neighbors. The church. Hard to tell what confession this is. Could be anything. A soldier in the army of Christ cannot lose. The one who doubts the Lord's will is aimless and confused. Do not doubt him, and you will not falter and will not fall. The side quests in the district have a theme of negotiation and diplomacy, but the church is preparing for war. Do you think there is going to be a war? Hard to say. The Brotherhood and the Protectors have been promising war for decades, but delivering nothing but cheap talk and empty threats. Maybe the church will finally set it off. Who knows? You should join them. The pay is good. This is where we finally advance the main quest. The church archivist explains that the machine is a portable life support system. Proxima should be perfectly habitable, but just in case it's not, the machine would ensure human survival. The device can change the balance of power on the ship. Whoever controls it can subjugate the rest without a shot being fired. We need to fortify the armory as soon as possible. Faith thinks we should give it to the protectors. Speaking of... The Brotherhood ain't what the mutineers used to be, and by the looks of it, the protectors are much harder than the ship authority ever was. Kane lives. Sights to see. The Bounty Office. What do we have here? I caught the Brotherhood spy, sir. Death by Jeb. What does it mean to serve the mission anyway? The mission is to get to Proxima. I don't believe anyone on the ship is against this. Obviously, we are not gonna turn back to Earth. We aren't gonna find a different planet. We can't exist on the ship indefinitely. Is anyone against the mission? Silas, the newly promoted commander of the Protectors, clarifies some things for us. He and his predecessors are the face of the organization. But the real power is held by the executive committee. Each member of the committee is a direct descendant of the original bridge officers, the mission personified. This, I assume, is the communications room. Reminds me of the seal chamber from Evangelion. So these people are in an ancient blood feud with the mutineers. They don't actually seem to have any other beliefs. This isn't how I picture the protectors of the mission. If this is the best we managed to build in a century, I wonder if we'll fare any better on Proxima. Anyway, we shouldn't forget about our duty to the motherland, which is the pit. Jonas wanted us to make an alliance with the free people of Shuttle Bay, a location accessible from the habitat. Some time ago, Moses Jackson's Rifleman, a small mercenary outfit, claimed the Shuttle Bay, creating a permanent settlement. The community quickly grew in size, attracting refugees from the habitat and even from the free city. The problem is, this place is in a geopolitically disadvantageous position. We've seen this before. Just like the access to the factory is located near the Brotherhood compound, the lift to the Shuttle Bay happens to be next door to the Protector's HQ. 
unlike in Fallout or in the Age of Decadence, in this game you can't really tell how dangerous someone is at a glance. Like these three don't look very menacing, but it was one of the hardest fights in the game for me. And the loot is… nothing special. There is a bugged nav mesh here, but it's probably fixed already, I'm playing an old version. And these are the shuttles, that's how we get to the surface. Starfarer is probably too big to land on Proxima. Don't tell me you still believe that old shit. There is no Proxima, never was. That's just the carrot they invented to get our ancestors on board. Who is they? The fucking earthlings, who else? The ship is their solution to overpopulation. Load the undesirables on a fleet of cargo hulks and dump them into deep space like garbage. Overpopulation is also a concern for the protectors. Their strike team will be here in 24 hours. They'll kill everyone who resists and conscript the rest. Mo Jackson is troubled. The riflemen don't stand a chance in a fight against a habitat faction. He wants us to convince the refugees to go back, and he refuses to help Jonas. We take no sides, he says. A good man, but very risk averse. Time to replace him. There are several candidates who will be more receptive to our requests. This plotline can develop in a number of directions. In our case, one of the leaders of the refugees invites Mo to their camp and then executes him by a firing squad. This is unfortunate, but it had to be done. So they have arrived. Oh, so that's why the nav mesh was bugged. How do we solve this problem? The best option is a decapitation strike against the protector's commanders. The sound of gunfire in the background are the invaders attacking the fort. The officer we just killed had a command implant installed in his cranium. When he died, the implant broadcasted that fact to the soldiers, causing them to flee. The shuttle bay is safe. For now. This is not just plot contrivance, by the way. Implants like this are a mechanic in the game, and I have one installed in Malachi. In any case, we won. The new leader of the Rifleman, I forgot his name, gives us a trophy. A disabled energy cannon. That'll be useful for something, probably. But there is no alliance between the shuttle bay and the pit. Jonas won't be happy with this. Time for us to travel back to the free city. But before we go, we should pick a patron nation. If the machine is important enough to change the balance of power on the ship, everyone will want it, and we can't protect it with just our party, or even with Jonas idiots. The argument in favor of an alliance with the protectors, if that is even possible, is that they are the most militarily powerful faction on the ship, and we shouldn't attach ourselves to a losing side in the coming war. That's just bad politics. The church is an interesting option. Unfortunately, because of a number of bad choices I made, we weren't even allowed an audience with whoever is in charge. So that leaves the Brotherhood. Let me make it clear. If you can deliver the machine to us, the reward will be worth the effort. Anything you want and we can provide, you will get. And I do mean anything. For our part, we'll provide security and see if we can open a few doors. Garrett will handle the security part. Garrett was the individual who press ganged the keepers into the Brotherhood service back during the factory drama. We need to make sure the machine actually functions properly. In order to do this, we travel to the ship's underbelly, the ECLSS, Environmental Control and Life Support System, maintained by the reclusive cybernetic monks. How goes the war, little brother? Which war is that? The war you are fighting right now. Fish swim, birds fly, men wage war. The blood meridian pilled individual is providing a very important service, implant overclocking. Essentially, it doubles the effects of an implant at the expense of max HP. Worth it for high constitution characters. This is the reason we've been saving money. I am old enough to remember the mutiny. My memories tell me it was a difficult decision to subject myself to deep space tech, but it was necessary to ensure the continuation of life on the ship. A good shepherd always protects the herd. Eli gives us a side quest to destroy a still active ancient Terran robot. But that's way beyond our abilities. And this is where we meet our friend Shadow. Remember him? He starts a sophisticated heist mission to steal an eye of a church higher up in order to get past the retinal scanner blocking access to the lower levels of mission control. But we are not skilled enough at stealth. 
Garrett invites us to meet the ECLSS leadership. This individual, Azrael, is a soldier from the first days of the mutiny. The monks saved his brain, the rest of the parts had to be replaced. Why does a maintenance crew need a combat cyborg? Faulty gadgets and burst pipes aren't the only difficulties we face in the field. Unlike Azrael, who is ancient, Zeta IV was reborn only 25 years ago. She's a third-generation cyborg. Many of the monks came from the original maintenance crew, but they're still capable of making new ones, if required. This is Ava Miller, Chief Technician Officer of Starfarer. We tell her about the machine. Bring it to us, she says. All it needs is fuel. We'll do the rest. Why do you want it? To maintain life support until Starfarer reaches its destination. That is our mandate. Functional capacity continues to deteriorate. Currently, we are at 57%. Operational standard is 85%, but the Earthborn can tolerate as low as 70. The projected duration of the voyage was exceeded over 80 years ago. Damage sustained during the mutiny complicates matters further. Systems and working conditions have been deteriorating ever since. The machine from the armor can be integrated into the ship's systems and hopefully it can buy us enough time to reach Proxima. One has to wonder, there doesn't seem to be any windows on the ship. How do we even know if we reached Proxima? Perhaps we did, decades ago. Maybe the medieval nations of the planet are studying us right now with their primitive telescopes. Ava says that in order to get fuel for the machine, we need to go to the heart of the ship, the place where the mutants live. The heart is implemented in the current build of the game, but not in the one I'm playing. Let's go back to the pit and see what changed. Bartholomew of the Detroit gang is in charge of the toll road at the factory. He's impressed to see an agent of the Brotherhood escorting us. Garrett can join the party as a companion. Depending on which faction you sided with, you get a different follower. Malachi, asks Tanner, the person who gave us the key to the armory in the beginning of the game, essentially starting all this. Aren't you a sight for sore eyes? Rumors were circulating around the pit. He did his best to fortify this place. At this stage, the game opens up. We can freely travel almost anywhere on the ship. They say you can't go home again, but here we are. Free drinks are still on offer to the brave heroes of the gunfight at the Regulator's base. You'd be hard-pressed to find any man not claiming that honor. They tried to stroll in here and take over. Of course, we all know who is behind it, don't we? The Brotherhood. New arena fights. The battles are very hard, as expected. New side quests. Protect the trader named Zabulon, who is making a deal with a hard crew from the abandoned decks. Help Jonas govern the town, something he clearly doesn't know how to do. I hope you have good enough social skills to save him from himself. Since I'm playing an older version of the game, the implemented content ends here, with many questions left unanswered. It seems that giving the machine to the cyborg monks is a no-brainer decision, unless we have already reached Proxima. Whose vision will unite the shipborn and become a foundational idea of the human civilization in the new world? Or perhaps we are the mutants of the past? What will be the fate of the medieval alien civilization already inhabiting the planet? Why did the game make a point of showcasing the killer cyborg in ECLSS? Mysteries. So this was Sid Meier's, Brian Reynolds, Vince D. Weller's Alpha Centauri. Colony Ship, a post-Earth role-playing game, is available on Steam in early access. According to Iron Tower, the game is 85% complete, with the full version releasing later this year. You all should buy this game, because I want Vince to write a sequel where a bunch of neurodivergent mutant cyborgs convert alien bugs to Christianity. Alright, patron credits, and then we'll talk about some of the stuff that didn't work for me. This channel is being kept together by the selfless effort of the ECLSS life support workers, including Jim Lawrence, Ilya Rubin, Yuri Solodovnichenko, Source is the best engine ever made, Noir, Snafu, I Feed My Parrot Chicken, Ray Nurse, Dawn, Jackson Phillips, Buck Swope, City Rom Fossil, A Two Room Apartment in Bobrusk, Belarus, Dark Bot Pumpkin, Nathan Kabiska, 1967 Ford Mustang, C6, Tony Spagani, 
Danny Kilpatrick, Ganso Bomber Motherfucker, Mache Va Azazel and Baneful the Doggo, Dima Urban. So, some suggestions and criticisms. First of all, the character creation screen is overloaded with information. It looks like a MiG-21 cockpit. The aesthetic customization should be delegated to a separate screen, IMO. The Age of Decadence was already like this, and it feels like a step back. The dialogue UI could also use some work. The text box should probably be positioned closer to the center of the screen, so it's on the same eye level as the thing we're talking to. That reminds me, visual storytelling. Why not take advantage of it? When Eli asks us to destroy a robot, show the robot. And then as the conversation progresses, zoom in to show off the cool model the artists created. And then focus back on Eli before the conversation is over so that the player is not disoriented. There should be more decision-making opportunities in combat encounters. Overall, combat is better than in AOD, but not quite as satisfying as in Underrail. Maybe give every character a cool down based ability unique to them, like uh, perhaps Jab can yell a bunch of obscenities via combat barks to make the target focus their attention on him. Will that work? Is that stupid? I don't know. Finally, nobody likes exposition dumps and Colony Ship begins with one. Something like this is unavoidable. In order for the game's magic to work, the player needs to be fed a bunch of facts about the world. Great games to copy here are Fallout 1 and the Stalker Call of Pripyat. Both of these get you up to speed without being boring, both are succinct, both use slides and voice acting. This is an instance when a voice actor can bring a lot of flavor and help process exposition. As an example, one way of doing this would be to make Eli read his private journal listing important events in the history of Starfarer in chronological order, with his voice becoming metallic once he enhances himself with deep space implants and then eventually turn completely emotionless as, over the decades, he forgets how it is to be human. How goes the war, little brother? I don't know, but I've been told. I don't know, but I've been told. Deidre's got a network, no. Deidre's got a network, no. Blacks to press the on switch. Blacks to press the on switch. Dig that crazy guy on witch. Dig that crazy guy on witch.